So what is a project manager and do you need one? So what do project managers actually do? So there's a whole list of things. Okay, on today's show, I have the Mike Lander. He's the director of nsol.co.uk. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, James. Tell us a little bit about you and your background. Sure. Um, so I've had over 25 years of experience in project and what I would call program management, and that's in the corporate world. So I used to work with large investment banks. I've been a consultant in a very large consulting firm. I've run my own project management companies, and I've worked in residential uh, construction projects for the last probably seven or eight years. So all the stuff I've kind of learned over the years about project management from different sectors, I apply to our residential projects. Great. Good. Um, I know it's becoming more popular but, uh, with residents, um, home, homeowners taking on uh, a project manager. But could you just tell us a little bit why you feel that project management for residential projects is so important? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of reasons. So um, first of all, most people don't do this for their day job. You know, most people have got uh, jobs that they do every day, which are nothing to do with project management. They might meet project managers during their day job. Uh, but it's not what they do personally. And so one, there's a kind of a basic discipline thing. I think two, it's the time. It's just the time to manage these kinds of projects right from the concept stage through the design and then uh, on site. Uh, there's a huge amount of work to uh, bring the project in on time, uh, coordinate uh, often kind of hundreds of third parties, suppliers and contractors, uh, and bring it in on budget. Again, because these are residential projects, that is people's personal money, it's their personal savings, uh, and therefore it's critical that the project's well managed, comes in on time, uh, and hits its budget. I couldn't agree with you more, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a really good slide show presentation here that you're going to show us. So can we just kick off with, what, what's its title, just in case um, people listen to the audio version? Yeah, sure. So it's Project Managing a Home Renovation, and I've called it my top 27 hints and tips rather than my top three. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's just kick off. Let's go through it. Sure. So the things we're going to cover today are just some basic principles, first of all, and then what is a project manager and why do you need one? Then we'll talk through what the project managers actually do uh, day to day. Think about some of the challenges that everyone faces and how you address those. And um, talk about risk management uh, and what that really means. Uh, lots of people talk about risk, but I think it's useful to kind of quantify it and then talk through how you manage it. Look at the house renovation project phases and then I'll just pull it together with a few conclusions. Fantastic. Okay, so let's dive into the content. So uh, for those of you that can see the, the, the slides, um, there's basically the, the, there are three elements to any project, or four. You've got the scope of the project, you've got the cost, i.e. the budget, you've got a start and a finish time, uh, and then a quality. And what you're always trying to do is all project managers are trying to juggle those kind of four components all the time. For example, um, if you want to increase the scope of the work, I want to extend the extension that you're doing, and that's got budget and time implications. You could put more people on site, uh, but it's going to cost you more money. And then at the center of all this, constantly managing the quality. Um, one of the things I think that it's so important for residential homeowners to look at uh, employing a project manager uh, that's a, a third party professional is if you leave a builder to manage their own project, it's not that they're bad people, they're good people, they're trying to do a good job, but the quality of what you're going to live with, the builder's not thinking about that every single day, about the quality that you're thinking about. They're trying to finish it on time, they're trying to get it in on budget, and then move on to their next job. So you've got to manage that quality and make sure there's no shortcuts. So I think my top tips for the kind of this uh, piece are, uh, set a baseline and then manage all those constraints against that baseline. And by a baseline, I mean, You've got a baseline when it starts, when it finishes. You need a budget that you can try and stick to and a scope that you kind of broadly signed off. You know, making sure that you as a client understand that triangle before you start the project. And then my third tip is, uh, which is a, a quite a famous quote, is if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail, basically. Absolutely. I think you're completely right. You know, you're dependent on so many others, and this is where the project manager comes into play to to con, to control and, and communicate between all of them. Do you Absolutely. think? Do you think that perhaps an additional tip, anyway, at the beginning, if you're the client or the homeowner and you're expecting to receive a certain quality or 
a certain way that something should look at the end, perhaps some images as an example to be showing the contractor anyway? Yeah, it's a great, it's a, it's a great point, James. Um, yeah. So what we do is that um, in all the projects that we have, we, when we start at the concept stage, so we've been engaged by the client to do a, a house renovation, we start at the very uh, beginning with some mood boards. So we're trying to get uh, inside the client's head and find out what kind of thing are you looking for? What did you have in mind when you started this journey? Mm. And those mood boards become really important because they kind of set the theme for the entire project uh, and sharing those with the builders, sharing it with all of your third party contractors. So a good example, we work with a lot of uh, audio visual companies who put in audio visual networks and internet networks, IP networks. Okay. And showing them the kind of finish that we're looking for, that dictates the kind of panels that they pick, for example, for the client project. So yeah, all of that kind of stuff, because at the end of the day, the client doesn't see all of the infrastructure that's put in behind the walls. That They live in the home, they live in the property. Mm. And so that's what you're trying to aim for. Okay, good. Okay, so the next one is about uh, importance and urgency. And this was really about, I think it's, you know, Every day that you kind of start in your own day jobs and, you know, on your uh, residential project, you're always trying to start with today and this week, what's important and what's urgent. Uh, builders have a habit of working day to day. Yeah. So uh, a project manager, they wouldn't brief the builder every day on what they're doing, but they're going to go to site when it's in construction phase, probably once a week. And they're going to talk to the builder probably every day. And you're always trying to focus on today and this week, what's important and what's urgent. Let's get that fixed first. The danger is the next thing that happens is there's loads of stuff that's urgent, but it's not really that important, but it's on someone's mind. Mm. It's on the builder's mind or it's on one of your third party's minds. But if it doesn't get solved today, it's not really going to affect the overall timescales for the project. And what happens is, Rather than focusing on the stuff that is important but not urgent, which you know you've got to kind of get done, you get dragged into, and we see this every day on our own, in our own lives, we get dragged into all sorts of stuff which everyone's shouting about, or it's on your to-do list, yeah. or it's one of your 150 emails, and you do that. And you get to the end of the week and go, I didn't really focus on something that was quite important to me, mm. but it wasn't that urgent. And I think that kind of epitomizes a lot of uh, renovation projects because there's so much stuff going on. It's too easy to get dragged into the weeds and you need to take a bit more of a kind of holistic view. And that's what a project manager should be doing every day, every week is what's important and urgent. Let's get that fixed. Now what's important that might hit us in the next three or four weeks that I need to think about. So my kind of top tips are, yeah, obviously work out what's important and urgent every day, every week. Abandon what I call the non-value adding activity. The stuff that's not important and not urgent, but someone is shouting about it, don't do it. But it's a really hard behavioral thing to stop doing. And then every week, just make some time to focus on the important stuff. And the example of the important stuff is you're in construction, you're, uh, you've selected a flooring that you want. The flooring's due in, obviously, at the back end of the project. You've not quite placed the order because you've not quite decided yet on the kind of final finish. You know, get that focused on. In that week, think about, I mean, I'm, I'm putting the flooring in in 14 weeks' time. Let's get that order placed. Let's get the finish finalized. Let's get the order in because it's normally on a six to eight week delivery. And that's the kind of stuff that I see. You know, classic ones are tiles, flooring, glazing kitchens they're always the things that are on long lead times so my top tip would be look at the long lead time items work back from when they're due to be installed and make time every week for thinking about are those things going to be on track i think it's at the same time those things if you don't order them in time and you do like put them on the back burner there is a, a big risk of them actually being out of stock or being discontinued absolutely well. absolutely yeah. i mean it's a the uh, our design team tear their hair out every yeah. day on projects because you know they selected an item with the client they selected it you know back in say uh, may the yeah. client never finalized the order uh, which means we couldn't place the order we come to place the order and the supplier says out of stock you know or we've dropped that product line there's a new one and you have to resource those all those products all over again 
And it's yep. so frustrating for everyone. I was just going on the basis of just going back a little bit about the project manager, maybe going to site once a week, but being in touch with the, the contractors on a daily basis. I think we could probably say together here that contractors have a, a habit of assumption so yeah. they would go with what they feel is best sometimes. I and mean, it's about that control because not necessarily what they are thinking is best, as the best method of installation or something like that is, is the right way forward and what the client is expecting. Correct. And we, um, to try and minimize the amount of stuff that's made up on site because they think it's the best thing to do, as you say, yeah. um, we do very, very detailed technical drawings for the builder. And okay. so... You know, we basically, we spend a lot of time designing it up front and then handing over the drawings to the builder on site so they know what to build. However, as you point out, James, you know, that relies upon a tradesman on site opening the right drawing, the right version number, yeah. and doing what's on the drawing. And we'll talk about version control later, but yeah, that's, you can do everything you can, you do everything you can to try and make it as easy as possible for the builder but they will still make things up. I just wanted to see, is it the right moment to mention about contractors or the client wanting extra work and this can throw things out of the original? Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's just an example, you know, like everything could be going quite well, but I think one of those curveballs is, is when the client already is, uh, on a live project decides that they want extra something and how you put that into the existing scope of works and the day-to-day -day. yeah and that's a great example again of a that's the role of the project manager for me the worst thing a client can do is um, and this and we see this a lot so we try and manage clients expectations a lot is they're going into work and so they think i know i'll drop in to site on the day and have a look because it's a lot of money and it's your own personal project yeah and you get there and they go oh i didn't actually want those plug sockets there i'll, I'll move them and so the builder says, fine, I'll move them. And then about three days later, the builder sends in an invoice to the client saying, you yeah, know, 150 pounds for changing those plugs. Yeah. And the client says, but I, I, I never approved that. And so the job of the project manager, we always say to the client, going on site's important, it's your home, come with us. We'll come with you and we'll walk around the site with you, which we do on a weekly basis as it gets towards kind of, you know, halfway through construction. And we'll talk through the project live and then anything you want to change will raise a variation. Once you're sure it's going to something you definitely want, we'll get it priced by the builder. We'll then get you to approve it. We'll do a drawing. We'll raise a variation uh, note. And then the builder will do the work. And then when it's complete, we'll sign it off and we'll get you to pay it. And that's a good example of it's all about variation control. And, the, yeah. and the, when it goes wrong is when the client starts to instruct the builder, and we've had a number of those instances, it goes really badly wrong. So what is a project manager and do you need one? So uh, there are three types of project manager or, or manager on any build project. You've got the site foreman. Uh, they're obviously employed by the builder to manage the tradesman on site. They're not the project manager, they're the site foreman. You've got the contract administrator. That's normally the architect that's done all the drawings. And they're there to basically um, ensure that the initial design that was signed off um, is what the builder is going to deliver. But most architects won't do day-to-day -day project management. They will administer the contract on behalf of the client and they'll make sure that, you know, if there's a question, a large question regarding something on the drawings, sure, they'll answer that. And they'll go to site, you know, once a month, once every kind of six weeks. But then there's the client's project manager. And the client project manager manages the whole project from start to finish. Some architects do do project management, but not all. I think that's quite an important distinction is you might think the architect is going to project manage your job for you because why wouldn't you think that they've done the design, but if you read their contract carefully, they'll often say we are the contract administrator and it's got some on-site oversight, but it's not weekly day-to-day -day answering questions and managing all the third parties. So again, typical example, architects will say, yep, we've designed the space. It's an, it's a kitchen extension and clients chosen the kitchen, but the architect will not coordinate between the kitchen company and the builder. So then the builders will have to coordinate that with the kitchen company. So unsurprisingly, kitchens are often late being installed, or when they're installed, the services aren't in the right place. And that's a good example of 
when an architect says, I'm not the project manager, that's not my job. So do you need a project manager? Well, it, I believe it's a profession that takes years of experience and training, like any job that anyone does. You, know, you, you need to have been kind of versed in that over a number of years. You do need to be tough-minded. It's a very kind of rational job. You're dealing with drawings and process and numbers, but you also need to be quite empathetic and very knowledgeable of the building trade. So what you can't do is, if someone's a project manager for, I don't know, a bank, having them project manage a building contract probably isn't gonna work because it requires real expertise and knowledge of the building trade. Mm. Um, <clears throat> you've gotta be available from like eight in the morning till six at night to answer dozens of detailed questions. And there's lots of personal money at stake. So you wouldn't leave, you know, 100,000 pound of personal savings in the hands of amateurs, you, you wouldn't do that. So a professional project manager will come in and manage that budget on your behalf. And they worked out on several projects. The extended project team is big. You know, it can be 20 up to 100 people on a project. That's a lot of people to coordinate. So I'd say, you know, do-it-yourself project management is one of the top three stress inducers in your life. So get someone else to do it. Yeah. Um, you can't do it off the side of your desk. So don't even try. And then thirdly, you've got to stay on top of the detail every day. I think it's also important to mention that um, you need systems in place. It's Absolutely. not something that you can manage on the phone or a WhatsApp group or, you know, even an, on an Excel sheet. You, you need systems in place to, that, that reminds the, con, uh, the project manager as well. And yeah. It also, yeah, it, it's a place where you've got attachments, drawings, photos, all of this thing in one place, maybe. You know, exactly. So, yeah. And there are now systems out there, James. So we used a system a while ago called Builder Trend, which is, you know, it, it's one of those. It's a portal where all of the information can be stored. It's yeah. got the budget plans in it. It's got all the documentation. It's got change controls. It's got the budgets. So, yeah, I think those, those systems are becoming much more uh, commonplace, definitely. Is it important to mention now about deliverables and what to expect from the, a project manager, or would that be uh, coming up? Yeah, no, we can talk about that now. So, yeah, so when you engage a project manager, uh, just talk through what you're expecting. Um, so obviously the ultimate job of the project manager is to deliver the project on time, on budget to the right quality level. So that's your kind of baseline deliverable is that's your job. Yeah. Uh, but then you ought to be looking at things like, you know, are there weekly reports? So do I get a weekly update? Are there photographs? So will you take photographs of the project as it goes on? Mm. Uh, will you be looking at as built drawings as well as the, uh, design drawings that were done in the first place? There's lots of things that you uh, can and should include in the scope and the brief for that project manager. Fantastic. Okay. So next, so what do project managers actually do? So there's a whole list of things. These are kind of some of my top of the head things that on many, many projects I've managed over the years that I kind of tend to focus on. Mm -hmm. So writing tenders and running the tender process, the way you get the best price from the building trade and the best quality is to run a tender process. You write a scope of works, you uh, send that out to three trusted builders that you know uh, as a project manager, you get tender prices back. And the key thing is they've got to fill in the tender at the detailed level. So many times I see poorly written tenders whereby the scope of work isn't detailed enough. And so you get a builder's price coming back saying uh, rear extension, you know, 40,000 pound. Well, that's no good to anyone. No. So the scope has got to be detailed enough so that I can compare like for like between building contractors. And that's how you work out where are they putting extra margin in to the process. And um, builders that don't want to reveal where they make their money often will not bid for those kind of tenders. So it's a good way of actually weeding out people that aren't being that transparent. Yeah. So a really good solid scope and then run the tender process. Uh, vetting and contracting specialists. So all the time, lots of specialists work on jobs, flooring specialists, AV specialists, IP network specialists, you know, one of the jobs is you need to vet them and make sure they're suitable and they've got the right quality for doing the job. And some simple stuff like, you know, checking their credit scores. With builders, I check their credit scores. So I look at their credit rating and find out how they're credit worthy. I find out how they dumped several of their previous companies and phoenix them into new companies. There's lots of signs that you can look out for that says, there might be a problem with this contractor. Uh, project planning, Gantt charts. So a Gantt chart is a sequence of activities that are interlinked. You need to build one of those and then do a replan and look at the dependencies week by week. Again, an architect wouldn't naturally do that. A project manager would. You've got all of the ordering, the scheduling, the chasing deliveries, 
that is a massive part of the job. As you get into construction and you've got all these third parties that are meant to arrive on site at the right time in a well-sequenced, well-ordered manner, that's a lot of work. Uh, managing third-party specialists, I think we've kind of covered. Quality assurance of on-site works. So again, you're trying to, back to your point about the images, you're trying to deliver for the client their dream. And so you're trying to make sure that everything that's done on site is done to the drawings and has the right quality of finish. Good example is painting. You know, and there's one thing picking the paint color. There's another thing making sure that the finish of that painting, of that paintwork, um, of that decoration, is of a, very, of, a, of a high quality. And you might need to repaint walls. I mean, when I do snagging, the snagging list is often 100 items or more. <laughs> but you true. know, it's, that's just the, the day-to-day life of being on site with builders. Managing the project risks. So uh, again, a basic tip. All the risk on a project really is in probably three places. It's physically in the ground, it's physically in the walls, and it's with third party suppliers that you don't really know. So you're constantly trying to manage those kind of risks and work out, if I hit something in the ground that I didn't expect, what are we going to do about it? Trying to think ahead. You're obviously resolving day-to-day queries and issues on site with builders. Uh, You're getting, I mean, we must get probably 10 calls a day from builders and third parties on projects when they're in flight. Uh, just a lot of stuff to manage and nail down. Change yeah. control procedures we talked about is about the variations. So making sure there's a variation control procedure and then making sure that all the deliveries to site meet their spec. You wouldn't believe, or you probably would believe, James, how many times something arrives on site, the builder just accepts it at the door and then you find out four weeks later, as we did on one project, you know, the uh, induction hob had been delivered to site. We're at the end of the project. Someone unwraps the induction hob for the first time and it's shattered into a thousand pieces. Now, what you don't know is, well, did the builder break it or is it broken on delivery? So that again, a very simple point, but in our contracts with our builders, we specify when you accept an item onto your site, it is now your responsibility. If it gets broken or damaged or it's not the right product, then, because you've only normally got about kind of two or three days to reject something to a supplier, it's your responsibility builder and it's your cost. And that makes everyone kind of think, okay, maybe I need a room where I can log stuff in and maybe I check the delivery note against the spec. And if I'm not sure, I'll phone the project manager. And that kind of stuff, again, that's where things go wrong. You know, you get beds turning up and they're the wrong color. And then you go, well, a bit late now because we're about to move into the house. All of that needs looking at. Uh, Budget control and managing cash flow for the client. So again, basic stuff, keeping up to date with what was the budget, what's been paid away, um, what's the forward cash flow looking like in the next few weeks, and making sure the client's fully aware of that. Obviously, obtaining building controls, safety certificates, guarantees for the project, et cetera, and much, much more. So I think my top tips for this one are, uh, don't pretend to be a contract specialist. It will go wrong. So when you're tendering, they're relatively complex. You know, leave it to an expert. Gantt charts, these project charts, they're critical to highlight dependencies. If you don't have one, you won't know what the implication is of moving a certain date. And change change control procedures are essential if you want to stay inside the budget. If you don't care about your budget, by all means, don't use change control procedures and go on a voyage of discovery. But it's probably not the way that we'd run most of our projects. That's very good. There's a couple of things I just want to say as well. How do you deal with an unrealistic customer? And by that, I mean that, do you ever get someone that comes to you with 30 days notice, they want to start the project and you have to go through this tendering process, which does take time? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, so very good point. Uh, it is about, and back to that point about the, um, the kind of characteristics of a project manager, you need to be empathetic. You need to be strong and rational. Um, and you need to manage your client's expectations. So that's all about a conversation. So we have had, I think, one project in all of our time where the client was completely uh, unreasonable uh, and wouldn't listen. And that's really hard because it's the client's home, it's their money, it's their project. If they want to do things without our input, then there's not a lot you can do ultimately. But most clients, you know, virtually every single client that I've worked with is when it's explained to them about, you know, if you want to, for example, just go straight to, I've got a favorite builder, I'd like to use them rather than going through a tender process. When you explain to them like, look, you know, we're trying to get you the best price. We're trying to make sure that they've got the right skills. 
We're trying to make sure that they can start on site on the right days. Give us just a couple of weeks. It won't impact your move-in date. You'll still be in for Christmas. It's obviously the old adage. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, leave it with us and we'll manage it. Uh, and we will get you the best value and the best supplier. So yeah, I think it's all about having a conversation. And then just talk about the, the tendering process. It's good to have that because then you do see about where the margins are and who's competing against who and that kind of thing. But sometimes I would, I would probably say if I was the client that it's not, not all clients want to see how much margin is being earned on a specific task that needs to be achieved on the project. No. So, um, you know, just, I'm just thinking from both sides, if you've got yeah. also a builder listening to this and they do want to start tendering for projects and how they do it, yeah, they do have to be prepared to be quite transparent. Yeah, so I think, so let's qualify the margin uh, point. It's, it, it is an important point. So when I say margin, what I'm, what I'm really talking about is um, kind of price variation for a specific um, item of works. So... On a scope of works, typically you'd have about 100 items, things that need doing on the project. And so um, a builder will price all that up. We don't ask them or insist upon in any way, shape or form what the margin is per activity. Okay. What I'm looking for is, so it's a good, it's a good point to qualify, James, definitely, which is what I'm looking for is, is the price for that particular activity broadly in the range that I'd expect? So, for example, if someone's tiling a bathroom, and the, the, they put in a, yeah, a price of, say, I don't know, uh, uh, 1,500 pounds tile of bathroom. Yeah. But one bill was put in 300 pounds <clears throat> and one's put in 5,000 pounds. You know, the two extremes I know are wrong. And the one in the middle is broadly about right. So all I'm looking for is I'm not trying to get margin off the building contractor. I'm trying to make sure as a project manager that the quotes that are being produced have been thought through and are reasonable okay. and, that bases, and that's based upon kind of all our experience of running these tenders over many many years is that you're just looking for a sense checker of are these prices reasonable now there are if you look at 100 items what we would do is say look if kind of like 70 percent of those items are within range but 30 percent or 20 percent or 10 percent they're slightly higher or lower than we'd expect on balance you'd go actually that's a good bid it's coming about where we expect it overall. Because a builder sometimes is, is looking at different elements of that project and saying, look, they want to put in, you know, a light fitting in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I'm not, not going to price that. You know, it, it's just part of the project. Yeah. But they might increase the price in certain other areas to compensate. And that, I, I, I believe that's okay. It's okay. all about a sense check of where those prices are and are they within the range that I'd expect. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. And I just want to mention two more things about um, checking the the builders and the, their companies and seeing whether they've got like, you know, seven companies previous and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, there's a good way you can do that as well. You can have actually download the company's house app. And exactly. Check it out just like that. Correct. Very easy. So yeah. we use either, so I look at the company's house records and then I also, we subscribe to a very cheap credit scoring um, system. Okay. Uh, which gives me all sorts of other background details as well. So yeah, it, it, it's some basic stuff you can do. Fantastic. Okay. Very good. So what are the challenges that uh, everyone faces? So on every project, these are some of the common things that we see. So there's an overwhelming amount of information to process because literally you've got, you know, often tens, hundreds of drawings, you've got specifications and finishes, you've got supplier specifications of different products. There's a lot of stuff that can get on top of you. Um, hundreds of decisions ranging, ranging from architectural design through to, you know, internal door hinges and, you know, what finishes you want on a certain uh, feature wall, uh, what handles you want. There's, there's, there's a huge amount of details. Um, I said that it can often feel like herding cats. Um, it really is. People are going off in different directions and you're trying to pull it all together and have a coordinated approach. So it actually takes quite a lot of time as a PM on the phone, talking to third parties, getting everyone in line. Uh, that's quite a big part of the job. Seeing the big picture whilst managing the detail. You're always, always trying to do that. Is that I've got an end date, I've got a quality spec I'm trying to hit, but I've also got loads and loads and loads of day-to-day -day detail that I'm trying to get right uh, in order to hit that end date. And keeping that balance 
without getting too dragged into the day-to-day is quite hard. Mm. <clears throat> and delays by clients making decisions. So for clients out there, if you've been given specs for sanctuary, glazing, flooring, handles, all sorts, um, you know, our request would be uh, as a PM is once it's been presented to you and it's a decision, but, you know, if you can make the decision in a timely fashion, it really helps. If you drag it out for weeks and indeed months, it will have implications down the line. And the problem we find is, is that clients don't remember that they didn't make the decision. Clients just get frustrated that the thing isn't finished. Yeah. There's no point in saying, well, we told you so. That's a pointless conversation. So yeah, making decisions in a timely fashion is one of my kind of top 10. Clients that want to change the design in flight. Yeah, I mean, basic design principle, you know, once it's in flight and you're on site, it's a bad time to change the design. So where you can, you know, keep those variations to a minimum. Challenges, you know, builders are a challenge and a huge asset, you know, in the same, same moment. So what we find is, is that working with builders that we know is critical. So we, we get some clients saying, um, would you work with our builders uh, that we worked with before? We tend to say on the whole, no, not always, but we've got builders that we work with because we know and trust them. Yeah. And because we've got leverage in terms of they work on multiple projects, so our roster of maybe half a dozen um, to 10 builders, you know, they work on multiple projects with us. So we know if there's problems on a site, they're highly likely to fix it for us because they know there's more work coming down the pipeline at some point. Mm. Yeah. Whereas if we get given a client's builder that we've never worked with and we don't know if they've got the skills to do this kind of project, really hard. Um, big challenge, unrealistic budget expe- expectations we normally get to that conversation pretty early on before we're ever engaged is that the number of inquiries we get from people uh, that want to do something, we always do a, a, a quite a big exercise up front on budget expectation management. If they're trying to convert a listed building from one format into another, and they've got a budget of a hundred thousand pounds, we say, we, we, we can't do that for you. Mm. you know, we think that's more like three or 400,000 pounds. Yeah. And managing the expectations right at the beginning, very important. Scope creep goes back to the variations. Scope creep is the killer of all projects where every day someone wants to change something and it's uncontrolled. And then two or three weeks later, someone presents a bill that the client didn't expect. And that's again, very common. And then just the selections of the fixtures, fittings, finishes and equipment out of stock, going back to your point before or not arriving on time. You know, the key things are, you know, keep your eye on things like glazing on flooring because there's some basic things. If there's no flooring down, you can't move in. Whereas if there's a light fitting missing, you know, less critical. So my kind of top tips on this are, uh, you know, keep your eyes on the prize, i.e. keep your eyes on the end date, on the end game, on the big picture, but focus your efforts every day on the things that matter. Use some project management tools. As you said before, James, there's loads of things out there now, often which are free. So things like Wonderlist. Wonderlist is a to-do list, but it's on your desktop. It's very simple. You can add things to it uh, and it keeps things under control. Um, Slack's very good. MS Project I use every day. So MS Project is a tool that I use for planning our projects. Basecamp is a very good collaboration tool. Not many builders, to be honest, would want to use something like Basecamp or Slack or Rike because again, you know, if they've got 10 or 15 tradesmen on site, um, those tradesmen aren't going to want to use that system. Their job is to get on and, and deliver the, the high quality trade. The site foreman may use the systems, but my experience is less uh, likely. And then again, use some basic change control processes. Okay. Just going back about the expectations of a client, I think it's a good point to just mention here that sometimes a client might have that unrealistic budget, but then there is always the build around the corner that will say yes. There is. Um, and, and it's only when they start that they realize how much work is, is needed. And then, they, then, then there comes the extra costs or I can't do it. <laughs> uh, a breakaway halfway through the project to say I haven't got enough to do this project for the price that I've promised you. Correct. So it's an awful thing, but I think that it's, it's that balance, isn't it? Because sometimes you really don't want to let a project go because you know it's the realistic, but turning away 100,000 at the same time is yeah. not. You're exactly right. Yeah. And in fact, one thing that I, I do quite a lot of is when clients are talking to us, they've emailed me, they've seen some of our stuff on our, online, 
and they start to talk through. Good examples are basements. So I get quite a few inquiries about doing uh, under garden and under house basements uh, yeah. for clients. I'm very, very clear and open. In fact, on our website, there's a, there's a basement cost uh, blog uh, that people can look at, uh, which is how much does the basement cost? Brilliant. Um, and uh, the reason I do that is because I think as a profession, we're kind of on a bound to help educate clients about what things do cost. And then if I've done that and the client still says, you know, so I want a hundred square meter basement, you know, I say, well, that's going to cost you 350,000 pound plus VAT for the basic shell and core. And they say, but I've got a builder down the road who said he can do it for 150,000 pound. Mm. I talk through all the reasons why it's probably nearer to 350K. Right. Because there's lots of complexity and there's lots of skills required to deliver a watertight basement. Yeah. Say, so look, you know, the reason that projects go wrong and these horrendous examples you see uh, where buildings have collapsed is because some, and it's very few, but some builders that will take shortcuts and don't do proper temporary works, that's when projects get into trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I, you know, I do everything I can, even if, it, even if we're not going to win the project, I'm, I'm happy at that point to educate a client around you know, why things cost as much as they do. And then they can make their choice. But yeah, we have to manage their expectations. Totally agree with you. Okay. Um, so risk management. So one of the key risks on a project, um, so builders might go bust, is one of your key risks, obviously. It's rare, but it does happen. So in the last four years, for example, five years, I've seen one builder go bust on a project. And we've mm -hmm. done a lot of projects. So do your due diligence, credit checks, references, etc. cetera. Um, problem with references is a builder's never going to give you a client reference where it's going to be a bad reference. It won't happen. So I wouldn't put too much credence on the client reference, but I would look at things like credit checks. Um, deposits, so less than 10% deposit at the start. If the builder's asking you for 20% deposit, there's something wrong. Valuation-based payments. So we always do every fortnight a valuation-based payment on a job, how much work was meant to be done, how much work has been done, has been done, and that's the payment really important that the client pays the builder on time. If the client fails to pay the builder, but the valuation has been done, then don't be surprised if the builder threatens to walk off site because they're running a business like everyone else and they need cash flow. Yeah. Uh, we hold 5% retention back at the end of the project for three months. And the standard contracts like the JCT contracts, that's just a standard clause. So you hold 5% back until three months after the end of the project. Insurance back guarantees. There's probably an entire podcast on insurance back guarantees and insurance for uh, homeowners. In basic terms, an insurance back guarantee is if the builder goes bust during your project and there are uh, you know, defaults to be corrected on the project or indeed the project to be picked up, this is more about when the project's finished. So if the project's finished and a month later something goes wrong and it's quite big, there's a problem with the uh, structural work they've done, Mm. but they've gone bust, you've nowhere to go. So if they've gone bust, their company guarantee is now meaningless. An insurance back guarantee will pay out on that defects work. So they're normally for bigger projects. So where you've got basements are a good example. Contractors building a basement, basement's been completed, contractors walked off site, a leak occurs in the basement two months later, builder's gone bust. Who do you talk to? Who do you call on? that insurance back guarantee is what you would call on because you'll find that your building's insurance doesn't cover you for that. And so what a lot of clients don't realize is, is that, okay, my building's insurance, what does it really cover? And so there's quite a, a lot more complexity in insurance for renovations projects. And in fact, again, I've got a check sheet that I use, which I'm turning into a blog in the next few weeks. So that'll be online soon. Fantastic. But the key thing there is insurance is a complex topic. Talk to a qualified, you know, reputable insurance broker about, you know, your project. Other risks. So fixtures, fittings, equipment, suppliers go bust. So again, the problem is um, if you pay for some, you know, some suppliers will say you need to give me 100% upfront before I deliver. Well, if they go bust post that payment, how do you recover it? So again, it's about picking reputable suppliers you know, reputable big suppliers. There's no guarantee, but if you've seen them on the high street, you know, in your local area for the last 10 years, it's probably a decent sign that they're okay. Whereas if you go online 
and you find a third party supplier in a part of the country that you don't know and you can't find any track record about them, but they've got a great product, just be aware. Um, stock holding in the UK, buying products that are sourced from overseas is a huge problem. Not only just on deliveries, but on, you know, are they real? Does the company exist? Uh, hard to find out about third party suppliers outside the UK. Mm. Furniture, you do have to put down a 50%, 50 deposit on placing the order. And that's because they make to order. They don't make to stock, stock these days. So you're, you've got to make sure when you're ordering furniture, you know, you know exactly what you're ordering and the supplier you've chosen as far as you can tell isn't in trouble. Other risks, project time overruns, that's down to control. So make sure you've got a, um, a project Gantt schedule. So interdependencies are being tracked. Penalty clauses for actual loss by the client. I get clients saying to me, well, if the builder's late, I want to penalize them uh, for a thousand pound a week. And my advice to them is, well, actually, legally, that's pretty hard to enforce because what you're really looking for is actual loss. If you're renting a property whilst yours is being renovated and they're late by four weeks, uh, and it's not uh, because the clients changed their scope, it's because the builder's just late. It's reasonable to charge them for four weeks rent. It's not reasonable to charge them for you going on holiday somewhere. So it's about just being reasonable. Yeah. Uh, and again, fixed price contracts to a, a way of managing risk. Uh, budget overruns, basic things. Don't design it in flight. Design it up front, build it to the design documentation. Do your due diligence at the budget stage before construction starts. Change control, I think we've talked about quite a lot. Project contingency. Make sure your budget's got between 5 and 10% project contingency in it mm. so that the unexpected will happen. And therefore, those are the things that you, um, you know, that's where the extra spare money comes from. Top tips, you know, think, it, think ahead about things that could go wrong and have a plan. Do your due diligence and get a project manager and stick to a budget. Brilliant. Um, just to go back on the insurance back guarantees, I agree with you. I think it is a whole new episode. So it would be great to have you back on to talk about that. Sure. But about the online suppliers, you know, picking your suppliers, um, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Because a lot of people are attracted to these heavy discounted websites when usually the product, the, pro the product is inferior or, it, it, you know, the deliveries are not really met and they're delivered by third party deliverers, which, uh, you know, delivery companies, which causes a problem too. Exactly so, right. Yeah, yeah. Now all of those, as you say, the third party logistics companies that deliver them, they don't even know. We've often found supplies to site, you know, a third party logistics company will turn up with a product. They won't know who it's from. No. And it does, you know, inaccurate delivery notes. You're just left with, wow, you know. Is this well, they don't I care. <laughs> yeah, that. No. You're right. They want to, they want to drive off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. They've got their next delivery. Exactly. Okay. So the next slide is something that I'm not going to talk through in detail, but um, for those uh, that are listening, uh, uh, if you can get access to the slides, it's basically about project phases. So there are five basic phases to a project. You know, there's client engagement up front before you all start design, planning, and contracting, design the project. Then there's the on-site construction and management, and then you're handing over, and then there's the post three months. And within that, there's quite a few things that you need to think about in each phase. But I suggest, James, rather than talking through this slide, sure. I think people should look at that, and then if they've got questions, they can write into you, and uh, we can respond to them. Brilliant, okay. The next one, my kind of concluding hints and tips. So my kind of you know, top seven, eight points. Know your limitations. Project managing a house renovation is very stressful, it's technical, and it's very time intensive. The second one is the budget's your personal money and savings. It's probably taken you 10 years to get those savings together. So get someone who knows what they're doing to manage it on your behalf. Third one is yeah, design everything up front. So even down to the door handles on the hinges, design as much as you can up front, specify it all so that you know what the budget is, and you can hand that package to the builder to make sure that you get what you want. Um, so it's about documentation. Next one is making decisions in a timely manner. So as clients, don't procrastinate. You know, you might think you've got five months before the kitchen's being installed. Yeah, you have. But really simple thing. If you're getting a kitchen installed, 
and you want an Italian designer kitchen, bear in mind during June and July and August, they're not around much. And that's not just the Italians, most of Europe shuts down for a month or two during the summer. So if you procrastinate and place your order at the end of uh, June, you might find that you're at the very back of the queue and you won't get your kitchen until Christmas. So make decisions in a timely fashion. Uh, pick the right professional team to design, manage, and deliver your project. So spend time working out who are you going to work with for the next, you know, six to 12 months. Contingency, always build in five to 10% contingency into your budget. You will absolutely use it. Not all of it, but you'll use some of that. And after all of this, hopefully, enjoy it. It's a great journey and it's a great end result. But yeah, uh, hopefully this has been uh, helpful to people in terms of some hints and tips about uh, why a project manager can be useful. Fantastic. So where can people find you? <laughs> if you go on to ensol.co.uk, then there's uh, some details there. You can email me, uh, which is mike at ensol.co.uk, and we're based in Southwest London. Mike, that was great. Thanks very much for coming on. Some really excellent tips there as well. And just to let all of our listeners know, this will obviously be on our YouTube channel, the, the entire slide presentation. And... Um, this will go on the podcast very shortly. Thank you very much, Mike. Pleasure. No problem at all. Thank you. Bye-bye.